Hey everyone, it's Masood. Welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be Emergency Medicine Board Exam High Yield Facts Part 7. If you're an emergency medicine resident, this is information that you absolutely need to know for the in-training exam, which is actually coming up in a little over a month. And if you just graduated from residency, this information is very high yield for the ABEM qualifying exam necessary if you're going for board certification. Be sure to subscribe to get all of my latest videos. Let's go ahead and get right into it. First fact here, what is cytoalbuminologic dissociation? Some big words here. This is step one stuff that you might remember, but it's still pretty relevant for emergency medicine boards. This is where you have a lumbar puncture that demonstrates elevated CSF protein with normal white blood cell count. Why is this important? This can be a hallmark for a couple different things. The one that we need to know is Guillain-Barre syndrome. So if you do a lumbar puncture, there's elevated CSF protein, there's a normal white blood cell count. This is called cytoalbuminologic dissociation, and this can be a hallmark for Guillain-Barre syndrome. A negative inspiratory force of blank is predictive of the need for mechanical ventilation. This is a good one to know, especially for critical care stuff. It's a negative inspiratory force of less than 30 centimeters of water. This negative inspiratory force, the NIF as some people call it, basically what this is, is this is the maximum pressure that can be generated against an obstructed airway. So if you think about that, you have an obstructed airway, you kind of need to generate some pressure to get past that. So it's essentially a measurement of respiratory muscle strength. And if you have decreased NIF, you have decreased respiratory muscle strength, that's going to be a bad prognostic indicator and you may need mechanical ventilation for your patients. So just know a negative inspiratory force of less than 30 centimeters of water may be predictive for the need for intubation and mechanical ventilation. A traumatic hemothorax requires what size chest tube? For the boards, the answer is going to be a 32 French or larger. If you have a traumatic hemothorax, you're going to want a large bore chest tube. So you're going to go for a 32 French, maybe a 36 French, even all the way up to a 40 French. That being said, I know that there's kind of a movement to going to the smaller bore, the pigtail or the Wayne catheters for chest tubes. But just know that the board's answer for a traumatic hemothorax, 32 French or larger chest tube. Next one, hypotension that is unresponsive to IV fluids and vasopressors is characteristic of blank. This is going to be adrenal crisis. This one, useful for the boards, but also really useful for, for real life. If you have a patient that's hypotensive, you're giving them fluids, you're starting them on levofed, all these different things, and it's just not working, you need to consider potential adrenal crisis. They may need a dose of stress dose steroids, that kind of thing. So just know hypotension, unresponsive to IV fluids and vasopressors, we need to be thinking about adrenal crisis. Next one, what is the reversal agent for dabigatran? Remember, this is Pradaxa. It's a direct thrombin inhibitor. And some people know the trade name for Pradaxa. The reversal agent is Praxbind, but that's not going to be on the test. We need to know the actual generic name, and that's going to be Idaricizumab. This is a monoclonal antibody. It's going to be the reversal agent for dabigatran. You need to know this word here, Idaricizumab. Hopefully I'm saying that right, but just know what it is so that if it is on the boards, if it is on your ITE coming up in a couple weeks here, you'll be able to get that right. Just move on right to the next question. In children, the combination of abdominal pain and anemia should raise suspicion for blank. Of course, with something like this, the differential diagnosis is broad, but anemia and abdominal pain, one thing you absolutely need to have on a differential, especially for those boards, especially for the ITE, is going to be lead toxicity in children. Really important to know that. Good pasture syndrome is associated with what lab marker? Again, some of the stuff all the way back in medical school in step one, you know it from then, still relevant. It'll still come up on the ITE. It'll still come up on the qualifying exam. Good pasture syndrome is associated with anti-GBM antibody. The disease itself is also sometimes called anti-GBM antibody disease, so just know that association. What medication should be given to patients with refractory hypotension in the setting of anaphylaxis who are on beta blockers? This is an important one. The answer is going to be IV glucagon. The reason being is that these patients that are on beta blockers who go into an anaphylaxis can have a blockade of their beta receptors, and that can prevent epinephrine, which is the mainstay of treatment, from binding to those receptors. So we can use IV glucagon. It has positive inotropic and chronotropic effects that are not mediated through beta receptors. So if you have a patient who's on beta blockers, they're in anaphylaxis, you're giving them epi, they're still hypotensive, they're not getting better, consider giving them IV glucagon, and that may help to relieve some of those effects. Hanox Shonline purpura is associated with blank antibodies. This is going to be anti-IgA antibodies. One of the newer names for Hanox Shonline purpura is also called IgA vasculitis. So you definitely want to know it by both names and know the association with anti-IgA antibodies. Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis demonstrate which type of hypersensitivity. You have to remember the different types. And in this case, it's going to be a type 4 hypersensitivity. Remember, this is the only one 
that is cell mediated. It's T cell mediated. And that's the type of reaction that we're seeing with Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. What is a common complication of a Lafort 2 and Lafort 3 fractures? This is going to be CSF rhinorrhea. You're going to look in the ears. There's going to be some clear fluid. It's going to be indicative of CSF rhinorrhea if you have a Lafort 2 and 3 fracture. What is the most common nutritional deficiency in children? Be careful here. The answer is actually iron. Iron is the most common nutritional deficiency in children. Vitamin D is up there. It's a close number two, but the most common nutritional deficiency in children is iron. Moving on here, gout crystals are blank when perpendicular to polarized light, whereas pseudo gout crystals are blank. Again, this is some ridiculous step one stuff, but I have seen it come up in board questions for the ITE and for the qualifying exam, so you do want to know it. Gout crystals are blue when perpendicular to polarized light, whereas pseudo gout crystals are yellow. Just try to commit that to memory. It's a silly question, but you may be seeing it on exam day. What is the most common surgical emergency in the elderly? This is a really important one to know. It may not be what you think it is. It's actually acute cholecystitis is the most common surgical emergency in the elderly. What medications, when used in combination with opioids, are associated with increased risk of opioid-related death? There are, of course, several medications. Benzodiazepine certainly high on that list, but the main ones that you need to know for the ITE for the qualifying exam are going to be pregabalin and gabapentin. These medications in particular, when used in combination with opioids, are associated with nearly a 49% increased risk of opioid-related death. So be very cognizant of this for the boards and also in real life. If you have any patients that are on one of these medications, you really need to be careful about prescribing one of the other ones because there is an increased risk of death with it. What is the treatment of choice for scabies in pregnant patients? Hopefully this isn't something that you're having to deal with in real life, but for the ITE, for the ABEM qualifying exam, the answer is going to be permethrin is the treatment of choice for scabies in pregnant patients. Patients with methanol toxicity should receive supplemental blank. This is going to be folinic acid. Remember, this helps to promote the conversion of toxic metabolites, so if anyone has as a methanol toxicity, they should be getting supplemental folinic acid. What electrolyte abnormality can occur with ethylene glycol toxicity? This is going to be hypocalcemia. The reason being is that ethylene glycol metabolizes to oxalic acid, and that oxalic acid can combine with calcium to create calcium oxalate, a very common cause of kidney stones. So just know ethylene glycol toxicity, we want to be thinking about hypocalcemia. Tenderness to the posterior aspect of the testicle is suggestive of blank. This is going to be suggestive of epididymitis. Really important to know that tenderness to the posterior aspect of the testicle. What is the most common viral cause of rhabdomyolysis? Pretty interesting one here. It's actually influenza is the most common cause of rhabdomyolysis, the most common viral cause. Some sources say influenza A, some sources say influenza B, so jury is still a little bit out on that. But just know influenza is the most common viral cause of rhabdomyolysis. What chest x-ray finding is commonly associated with anthrax? I have seen a ton of practice questions on this particular topic. I have no idea why, but it's a widened mediastinum is commonly seen on chest x-ray in patients with anthrax. And the reason for this is because there's lymphadenopathy of those hilar lymph nodes. So that's kind of located near the mediastinum. So you get widening of that mediastinum on the chest x-ray. Just try to commit that one to memory because I see it pop up a lot. Decreased sensation between the first and second toes is suggestive of blank. These are those dermatomes, those neuropathies that you need to know. And a decreased sensation between the first and second toe is suggestive of L5 neuropathy. Here's your visual stimulus. As you can see here, L5 dermatome kind of takes care of the medial part of that foot, including that web space between the first and second toe. So if you have decreased sensation there, that is associated with an L5 neuropathy. Tdap is not used until what age? This is something that we're using in the emergency department almost every day. So we need to know some of the age restrictions here. Tdap in particular is not used until age seven. The CDC typically recommends patients get this around 11 to 12 years old, but just know that younger than seven years old, patients are getting the DTAP. And then if they're older than seven, they are eligible to get the Tdap. Really important to know that vaccination. What is the most common blast injury? It's going to be a tympanic membrane rupture. You have to remember the different thresholds for injuries. This is technically a primary injury because it's a direct injury from the blast wave itself. So a couple things to know there. Most common blast injury, tympanic membrane rupture. It's a primary injury from blast and it's because of direct injury from the blast wave itself. Really important to know that. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to get all of my latest videos. Click here on the left to watch emergency medicine board 
exam high yield facts part six and click here on the right for the entire playlist thank you for watching i'll catch you in the next one